Stanford University. So hi, everyone. We'll continue now with the program. Um, while in the previous sessions, we had a set of both plenary sessions as well as the lunch panel discussion, providing a broader overview on how the research uh, that we have planned for Ernest can support different types of stakeholders. Right now, we're going to get technical, a little bit more technical. And we're going to start with a series of uh, three sessions where we are going to uh, outline the work that is planned for the pilot projects or case studies. So these next three technical sections are going to focus first on challenges and solutions for uh, interconnected systems, followed uh, also by challenges and solutions for CT. And before that, we'll welcome the first technical session on solutions for remote and isolated grids. And with that, uh, I'll pass on the baton to uh, our moderator for this first technical uh, session, uh, Dr. Priya Donti, now Professor Priya Donti, Assistant Professor at MIT. Thank you. All right, yeah, thanks everyone. So I'm excited to introduce our four participants in, in today's panel. So they are Mani Venkata Subramanian, who's a professor of electrical engineering at Washington State University, um, Claudio Cañizares, who is a professor of electrical and computer engineering and the executive director of the Waterloo Institute of Sustainable Energy at the University of Waterloo. We have Quinn Tran, who is a power systems engineer at the University of Hawaii. And we have Michelle Wilbur, who is a research engineer at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. And they're each going to spend about seven minutes each talking about um, different work that they are doing to help to plan and operate remote or island grids. And then we should have about 10 minutes towards the end for questions. So please do have those queued up. You're going to hear, I think, a lot of interesting stuff. So um, with that, I'm going to hand it over first to Money. Thank you, Priya. It's a delight to be here as part of the Ernest uh, Consortium. Yeah. Yeah, uh, today, um, our presentation, I'm here representing uh, our team at uh, WSU, including several of my distinguished colleagues who are not able to attend uh, today. And also, we are working with uh, the local utility, Avista, who has been a strong uh, partner uh, in this uh, effort. So our uh, project is um, about the pilot for uh, one of our uh, Native American tribes um, in Pacific Northwest, the Spokane tribes. Uh, we are working with them to develop a resilience plan for uh, a microgrid solution for them. And how do we advance the slides? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. yeah, is there a big green button on there? Oh, OK. okay. okay. I have to learn. <laughs> Technology first. <laughs> the motivation, uh, this, uh, you know, we have had, we hear about wildfires here in California, forests in uh, Northwest as well. And especially when we have a catastrophic event like wildfire, it affects the remote communities, uh, especially severely. And for instance, uh, the Spokane tribes, they were without electricity for several days when they had this uh, fire event in uh, 2016. So now they are looking at uh, potential solutions. And some of the key priorities are uh, resilience, as well as um, the tribes being a nation within a nation. Energy sovereignty is a key cultural priority for them. And so the question in the context of Ernest is, uh, how do we include these uh, priorities in coming up with um, resilience plan, how do we bring in the cultural uh, aspects into the formulation as well as into the studies uh, for uh, our project. Just to give you a quick background, I know time is short. Uh, the tribes, the uh, energy framework or the energy uh, loads are uh, like what is shown in this diagram. We have. Um, 
a remote grid, which is, uh, there is no substation in the reservation. It is uh, just fed from a distribution transformer. And um, the plan will be to study and model the energy uh, demands in the community, and then to work with them in uh, prioritizing uh, what uh, we should do in form of uh, the microgrid solution. And um, again, just to give you a geographical perspective, uh, it, you can see it is a heavily wooded part of uh, the state, and that is why uh, wildfires as well as um, wind-related outages are a key concern for this uh, community. So we will be working with them in um, modeling the needs and um, also the different uh, objectives they have as a community. And um, then we plan to um, test uh, the resilience plan in the form of uh, simulations and what kind of tools that we need uh, to do the study. And a key aspect would be how can we uh, quantify the benefits of um, implementing solution A versus solution B so that uh, they can make those uh, educated decisions for the community. And I should mention that uh, currently there is an ongoing project which is funded by the State uh, Commerce Department in Washington State. And this is a current feasibility study by uh, Avista to develop a resilience uh, evaluation for this uh, community. And we will uh, continue to work with them and then also grow the collaborations. Um, and <laughs> we, all, we are also working with uh, several other tribes in the Pacific Northwest, including uh, Northwest uh, Indian College um, is an important partner for us. And uh, we, um, you know, this is something that Lisa mentioned in the morning. And, uh, uh, you know, a key part of uh, the project will be to listen to the cultural uh, priorities as well as the needs of uh, each community. I don't want to really go into all of the details, but uh, the two technical challenges will be how do we um, quantify or how do we formulate the cultural priorities into technical problems that can be uh, included in uh, a resilience study. And the second would be, how do we quantify the benefits that come from microgrid solutions so that um, the community can um, take uh, oh, educated decisions? And so maybe I will stop this and say that uh, our plan is to develop a blueprint for a remote communities such as the Spokane tribes, which uh, hopefully will be applicable to other such uh, communities um, in the region as well as across um, US and now I understand from Canada <laughs> as well as in uh, Mexico. Thank you very much. We'll look forward to your questions. Okay, my turn, I guess. Uh, good afternoon, my name is Claudio Canizares. I guess you've heard about me already. Uh, I'm from University of Waterloo in Canada. Uh, and okay, I think I'm missing a title here. Okay, so the topic or the, the uh, our focus is going to be within this context of developing uh, pilots is focused on green hydrogen, and the GEN is highlighted because of an issue with the SOP, foodiness, uh, <laughs> and solar PV. Uh, uh, the researchers involved are myself, which I'm leading the group, and we have uh, three other researchers from the University of Waterloo with different uh, expertise. Sahar, which is focused more on the DC uh, protection, DC, power, DC systems. Uh, Xiaoyu Wu, which is focused on um, uh, hydrogen and ammonia. And Merda Prinia, which is fo focused on optimization and AI. Uh, now, what is the context? The context of this, uh, this project is that we are embedded in this issue of northern Ar Arctic communities, which is very similar to what is happening in Alaska. We have done quite a bit of work for over a decade or so, working with remote communities in the context of other projects in this type of uh, uh, planning issues. And one of the main issues is the pollution issues associated with, uh, uh, with diesel generation, which you have heard already about. 
Uh, and, and the issue is not as much how, my, how many emissions or how big of emissions because it's not much. The population is relatively low. However, the local impacts are dramatic. And one of the examples is soot, which basically melts ice a lot faster. And now this is embedded in the context of the issue that in northern communities, uh, uh, climate change or heating of, of these communities happen is uh, uh, taking place four times, uh, four times the, the rate that is happening in the rest of the world. So it's, it's quite dramatic. It's, what is happening in those local communities is, is quite significant. And we're embedded within the context of Canada, we're embedded within, within this Clean Energy for Indigenous Communities uh, uh, Act or, or, or initiative uh, in which basically there's a lot of funding being provided to move these communities towards, towards renew, renewable energy. So we decided to focus in a particular community. We have done work across the Arctic. We review many communities. But in this case, based on an experience, we focus on this community. Uh, now, why, why, why this community? Because it's, it's, uh, it's not really a, an example of the rest. It's very unique in the sense that it has, uh, uh, well, first of all, the most diesel and, and, and heat and power in the, in nor, in the Northwest Territories. Uh, and it's also is unique in the sense of the power grid. They actually have a, a natural gas generator, which you don't really find uh, in this community. So that, that's a different interesting uh, uh, distinction. The other, the other issue is that the, the, the amount of pollution or emissions is quite significant, although, as I mentioned, per capita is not that large, but it's significant compared to other communities in the, in the territories. Now, uh, NTPC, one of the issues is that this community has already reached the NTPC, the Northwest, uh, Northwest Territories Power Corporation limits on renewables. They already have reached that limit that was set at 20% of the peak power. Uh, and, and I guess one of the issues that we need to deal with is how to increase that, that share. Uh, and, and this 20% is fixed or is associated with the fact that uh, renewables, variable, variable renewables can have an impact on the microgrid, a uh, significant impact. Now, what are the research questions we're, having, we're trying to address? One is, well, in particularly we're focusing because of our partners and the experience we have had in these communities in the issue of hydrogen ammonia because it has other utilizations and it has this capacity of seasonal storage, which is a, a, an issue that needs to be addressed or can be addressed in these communities. Solar is only six months of the year, so, so how do you save that energy? Uh, and the other thing is how you improve the resiliency uh, and enhance these, these systems, existing systems. Now, the methods we're going to be doing, so the idea is not to build a pilot, but plan and design a pilot. So in that context, we're interested, as I already mentioned, the integration of hydrogen and ammonia and solar PV in this context, related to our partners. And based on that very extensive experience of Waterloo, we have written many papers on this. We have worked with the communities, and we believe that we have the expertise to basically look at these problems from the point of view of modeling and planning. Now, uh, the, the issue is how to integrate these distributed energy resources, the capacity and size of this pilot that we are trying to design. Why? Because our intention is, with the help of NRCAN or with interactions with NRCAN, eventually apply for funding to actually build this pilot. Uh, at this point, the, the funding we have is, allows us to do the studies and build a case for by building a pilot with uh, funding available through NRCAN. Uh, now, uh, and, and we're trying to identify in this context what, so, what role does this systems would, would, uh, would, uh, would play, and also algorithms, uh, algorithms uh, modeling, et cetera, for, for making this happen. Now, we're also looking at EV charging, because it's an important part of all of this, uh, given that in the characteristics of Indubik, a good part of emissions is transportation, uh, and also looking, as I already mentioned, seasonal and storage, uh, communications as well, and thermoelectrical systems, uh, because one of the important uh, energy uh, demands in these systems are, uh, are thermal. Uh, and we're trying to look at uh, different aspects uh, as well as uh, the, the, the feasibility of eventually a grid connect, connected microgrid because uh, things are happening in the north in which lines are being built that allow to incorporate these, these systems. Now, who are the stakeholders? Our industry partners are few positive. It's a Waterloo company uh, focused on hydrogen and ammonia. SC2 Technologies, which is the one who recommended Inuvik because they have done some solar PV deployments in that, that area. And in the process of doing this, we're trying to establish some uh, engagement with the, uh, with the Northwest Territory, NTPC, which we already had some interactions with, and Inuvik in the Inuvik community, which is part of our effort here. At this point, we don't have that engagement, and it's going to be part of the, 
the development of this work. And our collaboration with NRCAN, which we already have an MOU. Uh, now, what are the, what, how are we supporting the earnest goals? We are basically, the engineering challenge is how to integrate hydrogen and ammonia in this, which is somewhat unique, into these remote communities. The issues of resiliency from the point of view of control, in the, uh, improved control in the presence of re variable renewables, uh, and also look at uh, fossil, view, fossil fuel issues from the point of view of decarbonization uh, and the issue of en enhancing the access to energy in, this in these systems. And we're looking at an economic solution. So our intention is to minimize cost, overall cost, which is what we have done so far in all of our work. Now, what do, I, what do we anticipate as fundings, uh, as my last slide, is basically multiple financial mathematical models that, that may include some uh, AI and machine learning techniques based on the expertise of our group. Uh, and also the, the importance of collaborating with uh, indigenous leadership and communities and NTPC in the north. Now we are also looking at the value of this for the community uh, and the imp social implications of what we are planning to do, because that's very important. We, we might want to build something, but we need to interact with the community to see whether that's, that's, uh, that is something feasible. And looking at a pilot in, in the future. And, uh, the issue of, uh, of being part of support of these SDG 7s, the affordable and clean energy uh, efforts that we are, yeah, we are trying to uh, uh, be part of uh, with that. Thank you. It doesn't change. <laughs> this one. Oh, yeah. now it's changing. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, good afternoon, I'm Queen Chen, a power system engineer from uh, Hawaii Natural Energy Institute, University of Hawaii at Manoa. Today I will, uh, am uh, pre presenting for our research group to um, introduce our uh, Hawaii pilot project investigation of energy management with, uh, uh, for isolated grids equipped with hybrid storage system and high variable renewable energy resource. Um, so the pilot system is located at the Coconut Island, not east side of the Oahu Islands in Hawaii. Um, University of Hawaii at Manoa, under different funding resource, has been uh, uh, already worked with the local to design a remote microgrid, which uh, ensure reliable powers and uh, for critical loads during the grid interruptions events and provide clean solar. Um, powers, um, uh, transportation options. As you can see in the slides, as we have the current models of the remote microgrid, um, uh, this one is uh, have the both uh, combinations of the DC and AC system, which make the problem is more complex to uh, address. And uh, the op under this uh, funding opportunities, we want to. Um, uh, investigate the energy management models and then uh, develop and, uh, controllers to uh, uh, for the future advanced system simulation, with including the um, extent additional controllable loads, uh, next generation hybrid storage system, and uh, to uh, um, like secure the energy stability and achieve close to 100% renewable energy check it. Um, this one. So the method we to implement this uh, pilot project, we will analyze the fear collected data to understand the current system. And then we will uh, uh, develop the framework and algorithms uh, to uh, uh, to optimize the models to, for the advanced controllers so we can optimize the uh, eco um, uh, energy costs, the, um, maximize the utilization of uh, renewable energy and support resilient options. Uh, the whole control system is going to be evaluated uh, by HNEI uh, hardware in the loop testbed using the collected field data from the coconut island. Um, currently, we just only have the one uh, stakeholder is the Hawaii Institute of the Marine Biologists, 
and we are keep continuous collaborate with this institute to understand the current power crisis challenges and the needs in energy. Well, the project will be continuously updated through the workshop meeting and conference to make sure that um, the community and partner can uh, update the projects and then incorporate feedback from them to uh, put into the planning and decision making process. Um, so what this pilot project supporting for the UNESCO is gonna be, uh, it's gonna develop a model to determine the viabilities of incorporating energy storage solution to enhance the, enhance the microgrid resilience and achieve near 100% renewable energy utilizations. We also want to develop an uh, advanced control system which can maximize the uh, utilizations of the uh, renewable energies and then provide resilient uh, options for the isolated grids. We, uh, the work will focus on the isolated communities to ensure that the pilot project will address um, the specific community needs and uh, the challenges. We have the three anticipated findings that is a framework to analyze the feasibility to, uh, for integrating the uh, hybrid energy storage system with including the new battery energy, battery and um, hydrogen storage system for the remote uh, microgrid communities to enhance the resilience. We are also want to create a um, demand choice control system for assessing the dispatchable load to meet the power system stability needs in the grid interruption events. And the last one is gonna be advanced micro control that can optimize um, the energy cost, maximize the uh, utilization of renewable energies and uh, support the resilient options. And we thank to the Department of Energy, Stanford University, Hawaii, is up, um, uh, Hawaii Institute of Marine Biology and University of Alaska, Fairbanks, for support uh, and collaborated efforts in this project. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Michelle Wilbur, and I am a research engineer with the Alaska Center for Energy and Power at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. Um, although I myself actually live in the tropical balmy city of Anchorage, which uh, I didn't put a map of Alaska anywhere in these slides, but if we're down here and Alaska's up here and Canada's here, um, Fairbanks is way in the middle of the state. They're about negative 40 degrees Fahrenheit Celsius, doesn't matter right about now. Uh, Anchorage will be negative 20 Fahrenheit later this week, um, so we're, we're quite a bit warmer. And many of our project partners um, are in the rest of the state, but we work a lot with folks in the Northwest Arctic Borough up here in this part of the state. And um, you could drive. I had a very long day, got here about nine o'clock last night after getting up at 5 a.m., sitting on the runway in Anchorage for two hours waiting for them to de-ice the plane. Um, but you could drive from here all the way through Canada to Anchorage certainly not to Kotzebue up here in the Northwest Arctic Borough. There's no roads that go there and to many of our communities. Um, power lines do not get through Canada into the US. Even on what we call the rail belt, which is a subsection of the road belt, there is a small grid here that we're on that's kind of a collection of large microgrids. And about 200 of our communities are not connected by road or grid, waterway maybe, um, mostly uh, airplanes certainly, to the rest of the state and nation. So when we talk about a resilient grid, it's kind of resilient grids. Um, so anyway, in that context, we are focused on this project on our smaller microgrids more than what we call the rail belt, the larger grid. Uh, there's a lot of challenges, affordability, burning diesel fuel, a lot of the things our other partners have talked about. Um, you know, certainly we're looking at many of the same issues as Waterloo and Hawaii and uh, all of our partners on this stage. Um, but we have communities that are less than 10 households. Many of our communities are around 40 households. Uh, some of our partners in the hubs have maybe 1,000 households. 
the school is 25 to 50% of the community electric load. Um, the airport might be a part of it if there is really an airport more than just some runway lights um, and a weather station. Uh, there's maybe a GCI a cell, cell tower. There are not many loads and there's not many generation sources. And a couple illustrative examples, uh, we sent a, a power meter out to a new diesel generating plant that was going into a small community called Port Hyden down here on the peninsula before you get to the islands out in the Aleutians. Um, about, I don't know, a couple dozen households maybe. And they put that into place and, and they used our power, power meters because they were having a, the, power, the new generation system trip offline over and over again. It turned out that the airport was on one of their three phases and some big load there was enough that every time it came on, it was a big phase imbalance and it tripped off the system. So small number of generating sources, one diesel generator in that case, small distribution system, no transmission, small number of loads, really easy for things to get unbalanced and not work right. So reliability is a constant concern. Resilience is, is the next step up. And we have both things that we need to look at. And we have communities like Kotzebue. Kotzebue is a leader. They're doing the work, not the university. Kotzebue Electric and the community of Kotzebue are envisioning the future, choosing what they want, put in um, generation after generation of wind turbines. They're now up to ten, two megawatts of nice, reliable wind turbines that are working well for them, about a megawatt of solar that's installed capacity that's equal about to their three megawatt load, but it serves about 25%, maybe 30% of the total load over the year because of the high variability of, of that resource and no geographic distribution. Um, so how can we do a better job of integrating these resources? The communities are already wanting the transition. They have differences in geography and resources and things like that, but um, there are a lot of similarities between many of these communities as well, including right now a very high reliance on diesel. And as we can see, the diesel can be a reliability concern as it trips off. So, um, so we are uh, looking within our kind of, the rest of my colleagues might take offense at this, but small and scrappy research organizations. So I will tell you what we can bring to Ernest, but we are really excited about Ernest, about what this consortium of other researchers looking into the same things with their own experience and expertise and the national lab partners and everybody else can help us with as well. I'm extremely excited about this collaboration. So we wanna look at um, novel energy management systems and long duration energy storage is really of interest to us because if we're looking at variable renewables, not all of these communities have a wind resource. If they aren't on the coast, wind resource might be pretty non-existent. Everybody's got solar, six months of the year. It's really great in a month or so when it's cold, snowy, that sunlight is hitting, bouncing off the snow, hitting the, the modules, producing a whole lot of power. Um, but you know that's not there at all in December for our communities. So we are also looking at long duration energy storage, i.e. hydrogen or whatever else exciting might come along. Um, so so we're, we're looking at that. We're also looking at something that it has the working title of demand choice. So we, we are very different as far as what our communities look like and how they're connected. So we would like to go to people in the communities we're working with and say, Within your building, within your life, what is important to you? If we're gonna maximize this variable renewable source, if you have a whole bunch of wind, Kotzebue is looking at installing twice as much or more wind and twice as much or more solar again. So you have a very peaky generation profile and there's only so much the lithium ion batteries they have and are getting can do for them. Um, what, what sort of services do you need? And, and people don't necessarily wanna talk about it from an energy standpoint, but say you're looking at getting an electric snow machine or electric ATV instead of your gas powered one, how far do you need to go and when? What temperature do you want your building to be? How much fuel are you willing to burn in your fuel system or your um, wood stove to maybe match up with some cheap electric uh, heating when that's available? 
ask the people that live there what they want from the system, and then help design what those maybe behind the meter controls might look like in maybe sort of a whole home, whole home load, smart thermostat sort of configuration where what sort of loads are controllable within what parameters to meet the people's needs, but also to meet the needs of the grid because these utilities are small cooperative utilities. Each household is part of that electrical system. They're all working together to make this work out and to meet people's needs. So, so doing more to look into that. Um, and then of course we need to figure out how do these variable renewables, the maybe building level controls and the, and the energy storage of whatever duration, how do those work together to be able to provide that reliability and resilience for the grids. Okay, um, Kel, sorry, could I ask you to wrap up in the next 30 seconds? Yes, uh, this looks like I'm helping a community member. I'm actually asking that community member to help me tell, tell me what they want from in their location. So we have a, a history of working with people. This is Matt Bergen, who works at Kotzebue Electric, who is very interested in this project, helping meet his goals of figuring out how much solar, wind, storage, et cetera, to put in his grid and how to control heating in people's houses. Um, so we're really hoping to get some good methods to help with those questions I asked. And we have lots of partners. We're continuing to develop those, those partnerships and really looking forward to working with you all here. Thank you. All right, yeah, so some really interesting work here with I think a lot of kind of synergies between and among uh, the projects. And so um, we have uh, about nine minutes for questions. So kind of borrowing from a previous moderation technique, I'll sort of ask for about three questions and sort of let the, the panelists respond to uh, whichever kind of speaks to them the most. And I think that'll actually bring us to time. So um, yeah, any questions? So I actually have a question, if no, if, if that's okay. Um, yes, please. So I'm Jenny Mill, work with the Precourt Institute for Energy, help uh, shape their research portfolios. I have a question about uh, the long duration storage in Alaska, in particular uh, constraints or difficulties about thinking about what the technology might be, considering your temperatures that you mentioned. And you mentioned hydrogen, but is that constraining any, any choices that you might be able to make there? Thank you. We'll take two more questions, and then we'll come back to them. OK, I see one back there. Hi, Ben Hiddle again, oh, um, okay. PH4AI. Do you guys do biomass in, Can in um, Canada, and especially Alaska, for your wintertime needs? Because it would do the heat and the power, potentially? Thank you. And let me have a question back there. Hi, um, I'm Ben Taub. I'm a PhD student at MIT. Um, and I was wondering if any of you could speak a little bit about the trade-offs between investing in these microgrids versus investing in energy efficiency in the buildings. When you have limited resources, are you taking into consideration spending it in efficiency so you need less of a grid to support running these buildings? Thank you. All right, so we have just a recap here, questions on long duration storage, constraints uh, due to temperature, other things, um, biomass um, and its use, as well as kind of um, microgrids versus building energy efficiency. So I see Claudio has a hand up, so I'll let you go, and then Michelle after yeah, that. Yeah, uh, I just wanted to address the issue of hydrogen. Uh, it's an interesting question. Uh, hydrogen has been already shown for long storage to be a, a feasibility bella cula in British Columbia was shown that hydrogen can be used for long storage. Uh, now, the issue of, of, of thermal management of that system is an interesting question. And that's what we are looking at uh, trying to in, in, integrate ammonia in all of the system because it brings uh, different type of characteristics for storage and uh, thermal management as well. So we hope that that will address some of these questions. But certainly, that's an issue that you need to be uh, aware of the issues of temperature control, especially when you are compressing, decompressing these, these uh, gases. Thank you. Thank you. Michelle, go ahead. Yeah, I, I can that. answer all three of those very quickly, I think. So um, it's all about other people. So Paul McKinley in the audience here is our hydrogen researcher, and that is one of the very first things he has to look into is all of those logistical challenges. Will seals fail in the low temperatures? Or do we need to put them in heated buildings? What does that do about the fire danger? 
Um, what's the water source? How clean does it have to be? All kinds of challenges that we are looking into. So yes, need to be answered. As far as biomass, there are biomass projects. Um, I will not get into the sustainability of those from a carbon perspective and the timescales that things decay, but when we're looking at Amazon boxes, my friend Ch Chad Nordlam has talked about what can we do to insulate our buildings in Kotzebue better because they are not very well insulated and that's a big deal to get into the efficiency first, which is extremely important. We need to use less energy to meet the same needs. So maybe we can make insulation out of those Amazon boxes and insulate our buildings. <laughs> Thank you, Michelle. Money. Yeah, uh, just wanted to highlight uh, on the hydrogen question. Uh, we also have one of our lab partners, Indrel. They have a pilot study of uh, hydrogen as a long-term storage for a community in Southern California. So maybe if you are interested, Inesh can um, provide more details on uh, that pilot study as well. And on the biomass question, uh, I will uh, you know, uh, say something similar to what Michelle said, that uh, it's a cultural issue that uh, whether a specific community will be warm to the choice of uh, biomass as uh, energy resource is something that we have to uh, take into consideration in the formulation of a solution. And on energy efficiency, you know, from uh, what I have seen from our discussions, very much so, that is uh, included or that is inclusive in a potential solution and uh, how we formulate it technically and how much uh, energy savings versus um, the, uh, you know, the other effects, that's something that uh, we have to look into. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so I want to uh, support for the uh, answer is about the energy efficiency slides. We, we know that when we do the resilience um, activities, then we have to <laughs> increase the reverse energy on the battery. That is a trail pass. Uh, it may like, reduce the uh, economic efficiencies for the whole system, not only the buildings, but uh, that's one we secure for the system and the critical loads operating well when we have the interruption from the grid. And I think it's worth to do that. Yeah. Awesome. Cool. If I, if I can, if Please, I can add ahead. something about the efficiency. I'm not, not, not sure about biomass. I think it's relatively low production of biomass in these communities. And it's, especially in the Arctic, there's not a lot of vegetation to, to deal with. But however, in the issue of energy efficiency, it is true that it's, it's uh, the long hanging fruit. However, I'm aware that this is being a challenge. It's been looked at for many years. It's been a challenge from the point of view of uh, the social issues that in these communities they have to deal with in terms of house maintenance and, and, and you know, there's a lot of issues with broken glass, not fixed, and, and, you, and there's an issue of interaction with the community and, and, the, and the social housing. So that's, those are issues that need to be addressed as well Absolutely. as part of this. Yeah, and, good you know, money. <laughs> one of the important aspects, especially in the context of earnest, is um, the cost involved and the um, affordability for the community in terms of the uh, you know, energy justice that uh, is a key objective for uh, the earnest uh, project. And especially, uh, you know, we can talk about uh, federal investment to help out the communities in uh, the initial installation of some of these um, resources. But then we also need to have a plan for long-term maintenance and support and training. Uh, all of that um, need to be included in developing a solution, which is uh, one of the key priorities for us as well. Absolutely, yeah, a lot of, I think, kind of techno-social <laughs> political problems at play here with a lot of kind of deep cultural and local context and a real need to think about kind of uh, capacity and such in the, in the loop of that. Um, so in the last minute, I, I didn't uh, prep the panelists with this, so apologies for the, the last question, but just um, I will want to prompt each of you just with any kind of final takeaway that you would really like for the, for the audience to leave uh, this panel with. Um, and I may start. Well, I just wanted to yeah. add that, like Michelle, I'm looking forward to this collaboration. Amazing. I think it's very exciting <laughs> to see what other people are doing, <laughs> the problems they're dealing with, and hopefully we can help each other. Yeah. Yeah, uh, that's a good note to end on. I can think so. All right. Well, thank you so much, everybody. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.